It's the indecisive underdog that couldn't figure out what kind of car company it wanted to be while the big three was running Detroit. This little indie outfit quietly made cars in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Any Kingfish fans in the building? Yeah, dude, I love heading down to Simmons Field, grabbing a brew and a broad at Uncle Mike's Pub, don't you know? I do know, and you know what else? These guys made better cars than their Motor City competitors, from sick muscle cars, to the original all-wheel drive crossovers, to revolutionary hour-long TV dramas. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on AMC. Hey, Jim. What are you doing? Trying to open this can of NOS energy drink with my mind. And that is how you use your brain power to get your baby boy Nolan to open your can of NOS energy drink. Now, back to the show. American Motors formed in 1954 when Hudson Motors and Nash Kelvinator did the fusion dance and joined forces. Hudson made good cars, but they couldn't afford to redesign everything every year like all the bigger automakers were doing. Nash Kelvinator made refrigerators and those little metropolitan cars. So it seemed like a good idea for the two of them to team up and make smallish cars together. It was a huge, corporate merger. I'm talking the biggest in the history of history at this point. We definitely underestimated how big of a story AMC has. So if I miss anything and you want to know about another AMC car, let me know in the comments. Anyway, after the merger, the two companies started calling themselves American Motors Corporation. And for the first few years, their cars were badged and sold as Hudson's and Nash's. They started combining platforms and debuted a new Hudson Hornet and a Wasp. You know the Hornet from that adorable cartoon car movie. What was it called? It had, it had all those cars with eyes. Uh, Transformers? No, no. Uh, there was like cars. Uh, Herbie fully loaded? It's cars. It's literally cars. Uh, JJ Bang Bang. Cars! Why are you yelling at me? I don't know! I don't know either! I'm sorry! Thank you! Now back to the show? Yeah, back to the show! Apparently, they thought people wanted cars named after terrifying bugs, like that movie Herbie Fully Loaded. <laughs> and I guess that people were more okay with hornets than they were wasp because the wasp was dead by 1956. Have you guys ever had wasp honey? Tastes like sriracha. You could buy a Rambler model at either a Nash or a Hudson dealership, just like you could buy identical Neons at both Plymouth and Dodge dealerships. The company's CEO, George W. Romney, yup, Mitt Romney's dad, realized this arrangement was dumb and decided to brand all the cars as Ramblers in 1958, except for the tiny Metropolitan that was imported from England. That was deemed weird enough to stand on its own as a Metropolitan. The first all new car AMC produced following the merger was the Rambler Rebel in 1957. It had a 255 hertz per 327 cubic inch V8 and dual exhaust. There's not gonna be any leaders in this episode, Euros, because this is America, an American car company. With a 17 second quarter mile, the Rebel was advertised as the quickest four door to hit 60 miles per in America at the time. The Rebel was supposed to come with this brand new electronic fuel injection called the Bendix Electrojector System. But it had some bad bugs that couldn't be worked out and the feature was dropped before production. With a name like Bendix, that's probably for the best. In 1958, they also launched the Rambler American, which was actually the three-year-old 1955 Nash Rambler. That is the only time that an old car was successfully reintroduced and sold as a new car again. Good job, Romney. There were also a couple of big cars called the Classic and the Ambassador. The brand new 61 Rambler Classic, the compact car most useful to you. In 1959, AMC hired Dick Teague. 
There's nothing funny about that. So Dick Teague, a talented guy with a not funny name, had worked at GM, Packard, and Chrysler. He was known for designing incredibly good looking cars with tiny budgets, something AMC really needed because they were always broke. You don't hear much about these cars today, but at the time, Rambler was the best selling nameplate in the States. And remember, these guys are independent. AMC was taking on the big three. Around 1965, the company decided to start changing direction a bit and started making more large cars. The two-door Rambler Marlin was developed to be a fancier, bigger alternative to the Ford Mustang or Plymouth Barracuda. It had a really, really cool badge too. You know I have a soft spot for buff horses, but that's one buff fish. In 1966, they decided to move away from the Rambler moniker altogether and finally started badging cars with their patriotic family name, American Motors. 1968 was the start of AMC's glory years when they started making two of their best known models, the Javelin and the AMX. <laughs> Dick Teague used his mad skills to design the first gen Javelin as a sleek, semi-fastback coupe everyone could appreciate. AMC just didn't have the funds to make multiple body styles like you could get with the Mustang and the Camaro, but they made up for it by making a dang good car. The Javelin was a roomier, totally respectable and affordable competitor in the pony car market, and you can still get them for cheap. It also had a really cool badge. The closest thing we have to a really cool badge now, the Stingray on the Corvette and the Stinger badge on the Kia Stinger. Honestly, two coolest badges in the game right now. Fight me in the comments. You can get a Javelin with a straight six, but the one that Schwanny was the one with the V8, baby. The appropriately named Go package got you a 343 cubic inch V8 making 280 horse purse. <laughs> AMX was released six months later, along with a new 390 cubic inch V8 you can get in either car, making 315 hertz first. <laughs> the AMX had only two seats and one foot less sheet metal between its front and rear wheels than the Javelin. That meant it was extra sporty. AMX stood for American Motors Experiment. <laughs> Since no other US car companies were making two-seater sports cars, the AMX was actually considered a direct competitor to the VET. And the VET didn't really have another competitor. It still doesn't. We made a whole episode of Wheelhouse about it. I'll put the link in the description below. The Society of Automotive Engineers even named the AMX best engineered car of the year. It featured cool new safety stuff like three point seat belts and thinner, lighter safety glass that shattered into tiny little pieces in an accident so your windshield didn't slice your face off. Neat! AMC was keen on making the AMX a performance hit even before it went on sale. The AMX broke over 100 land speed records driven by racer Craig Breedlove. Yes! That name rules. The famous drag racers Lou Downey and Shirley Drag on Lady Shahan drove them at the strip. Yes! Cool names! And AMX almost won an SCCA championship. And another came in fifth in the Cannonball Run. You could even rent one from Hertz. Hey, Nolan, can you come here? Hey, James. Hey, do you want a Hertz donut? Yes. Ow. Oh. Hurts, donut. Yeah. Penske Racing did well with Mark Donahue driving the Javelin Trans Am. Well enough that AMC homologated a special edition Mark Donahue Javelin to legally get a rear spoiler onto the race cars. To bump up the car's profiles even more on the street, AMC added the big bad highlighter tone paint options on the AMX and Javelin. Big bad orange, big bad blue, and big bad green. These are some of the rarest and most collectible AMCs in the world right now. Everyone at AMC was so stoked on the AMX and Javelin that they went full force and built a mid-engine concept car. Ah! The stunning AMX3 debutted in Italy in 1969. The lucky folks who got to drive the handmade prototype said the performance was world class. The company brass authorized production of 30 cars as the brand's new flagship model, but the cost to build them kept getting heavier for the small automaker while the corporate piggy bank kept getting lighter. So, we didn't get that mid-engine American supercar. We did get some other sick 
super rare AMC muscle cars. The 69 Hearst SC Rambler was a sleeper in every sense of the word, except for the red, white, and blue paint job, the big old hood scoop with a vacuum operated butterfly valve, and the fact that it's really, really, really loud. Colby? <laughs> The regular Rambler was never a performance car, but this one had the buff 390 cubic inch V8 pushing its compact body around. AMC built around 1,200 of them, and they turned out to be the quickest cars that the company ever built. They were so quick that people started calling them scramblers. People are clever. Then came the 1970 Rebel Machine. The same big V8 went into AMC's mid-sized two-door, only this baby made 340 buff horses and 430 Turks perks. That was even more than the AMX. The cold air package added a big nostrilled hood scoop with a tachometer mounted on the hood facing the driver. Around 2,300 of these were made, and most of them were painted in red, white, and blue. By 1971, the muscle car market was already in steep decline and so were AMC's profits. But they didn't want to give up on making performance cars. Their answer was to raid the parts bin to build the understated Hornet SC360. The Hornet was their new compact car, so they dropped in an existing 360 cubic inch V8, then added a hood scoop and a little white stripe to let people know something was different. AMC hoped to build 10,000 of these, but things were so bad that they only made 784. As a guy who's owned a bunch of golfs, I want one of these. <laughs> Around this time, AMC took over production of Jeeps, including their military and postal contracts. That meant they also acquired all of Jeeps' profits, which had helped the independent company stay afloat. Meanwhile, the two-seater Amex was killed off, and the second-gen Javelin debuted with bulging fenders and even more muscle-bound looks. The Amex name became a high-performance Javelin package instead, and Penske Racing took the updated car to back-to-back -back Trans Am championships. Trans Am cars are by far my favorite looking race cars. In 1971, the mid-sized Matador was introduced with two-door, four-door, and wagon body styles. It was advertised as an all-new car, but it was really a gussied up Rebel with a bigger front end and an ambassador back end. The two-door was called the Flying Brick because it had terrible aerodynamics for racing. Even though the Matador wasn't truly brand new, they were good cars that buyers tended to overlook. And they still tend to overlook them. There's a few on Craigslist right now. I think they're pretty sick. They look like cartoons. Dick Teague. It's not funny. It's not funny. What are you doing? You're like 34 years old. Grow up. Now back to the story. Just do it. Now back to the story. You got it. Okay, you got it. Dick Teague. <laughs> Mr. Teague and Mark Donahue redesigned the frumpy two-door flying brick into a sleek and sexy second-gen Matador Coupe. It looked so good that it won Best Styled Car for 1974 from Car and Driver. Then came the AMC with possibly the greatest name of all time. The Gremlin. It was America's first domestic built subcompact car. The back seat was optional and only big enough for kids. It was weirdly nose heavy despite being rear wheel drive, but that's probably because it had a real flat butt, just like me. In 1975, the Mirthmobile was introduced as the first wide, small car. Did I say Mirthmobile? I meant Pacer. Wayne's World was one of my first favorite movies. It looked like a fishbowl and was originally designed to run a rotary, which AMC had contracted to start building in 1973. But rotaries hit the gas tank hard, and the oil crisis put the kibosh on that plan. So instead, the Pacer used a couple of inline six engines and a couple of flames made it cool enough to be Garth Al ride. Again, Wayne's World reference. I know a lot of you guys are too young, but I love that movie. You want to be like Big Bro? Watch Wayne's World. In the late 70s, things weren't going great for AMC. They replaced the Gremlin and Hornet with the Spirit and the Concorde, but it had to recall over 300,000 cars at a cost of $3 million. So they decided to partner with Renault and started selling Renault 5s as Le Cars here in the US. In exchange, Renault got a 22.5 stake in AMC. That helped spike sales and profits back up even though the economy was turning down. But AMC was still building their own cars in their inefficient Kenosha, Wisconsin plant. For the 1980 year, they launched AMC Eagle versions of the Spirit and Concorde as their new four-wheel drive line. 
much better. There was a coupe, there was a hatchback, there was a sedan, there was a wagon. So many sport utility crossovers to choose from. You want a sick Froder no one else has? Find yourself an old AMC Eagle, kids. They're still cheap. For some reason, things quickly took a turn for the worse and sales plummeted. Renault took a controlling stake of the company, which made American Motors Corporation a lot less American. The Spirit and the Concorde were done by the end of 1983. AMC started building Renault Alliance sedans in Kenosha in that year. Surprisingly, the Alliance was Motor Trend's car of the year and at the top of Car and Driver's 10 best list. It launched so successfully that the dealer network wasn't prepared to deal with that kind of volume. Then, the cars started to fall apart and they were done by 1987. Luckily, AMC still owned Jeep. The new Cherokee and Wagoneer were really taking off as SUVs started to become a thing. Customers weren't buying AMC cars anymore though. They made an agreement to let Chrysler use some of the empty space at the Kenosha plant for some extra cash. AMC's workers were mad about not getting raises and there were rumors that they were sabotaging cars on the line. Then the Pentagon got mad because they were still making Jeeps for the military, but now they weren't American, they were French. But AMC couldn't kick their French step-parents out of the house and had to sell that profitable business. AMC's longtime hero, Dick Teague, you told yourself not laugh at stuff like this anymore. Dick Teague left the company. Some of the cars that these kids are doing, and you know, a few years back, just a few years back, you'd look at those and say, God, they're impossible. I'll never build anything like that. So the future is just, uh, gosh, I, I, I just wish I could live to be 100 years old to, to see some of those things that are, that are gonna happen. Renault was having their own problems at the time, including the assassination of their CEO by French anarchists. So they weren't so confident about their prospects in the US market anymore. The fact that the three companies were already making each other's cars in the same plant made it easy for Renault to sell their AMC shares to Chrysler in 1987. And that was the end of AMC. And it really sucks that AMC isn't around today, but I think we should be grateful that we had them at all. Dad? Uh, Gus uh, Johnson tapes his mic to his finger. <laughs> <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> it's so tight. Oh, he's very scared of this.